great. I'm going to talk about eight and a half propositions for frugal innovation. It was going to be 10, but unfortunately, austerity stepped in, <laughs> and it's just uh, eight and a half. Uh, John's referred to um, the report that's just come out uh, that I've been a member of, and consequently, last night, I was quite excitedly uh, looking at Twitter and uh, media and so on to see what coverage there was in the UK. And while uh, browsing the media, I came across this very interesting uh, article that I thought was relevant to our um, discussions today. Um, and it's um, uh, a, a report about a major research institute has recently announced the discovery of the heaviest chemical element yet known to science. The new element has been tentatively named governmentium. <laughs> governmentium has one neutron, 12 assistant neutrons, 75 deputy neutrons, and 224 assistant deputy neutrons, giving an atomic mass of 312. These uh, particles are held together by forces called morons. <laughs> Since government, governmentium has no electrons, it is inert. However, it can be detected as it impedes every reaction with which it comes into contact. A minute amount of governmentium causes one reaction to take over four days to complete, when normally it would take less than a second. Governmentium has a normal half-life of three years. It does not decay, but instead undergoes a reorganization in which a portion of the assistant neutrons and deputy neutrons exchange places forming isodopes. <laughs> this process is referred to as critical morass. <laughs> so I guess that's our, our kind of typical view of uh, government and innovation, is that uh, uh, government and public services more generally are rather inert, not very good at in innovation. I think that's a, a very ill-founded uh, view. Actually, there's a great deal of innovation happening in uh, public services and in government. We might want more. Uh, we might want different kinds of innovation, but there's a great deal. And if you ever need to counter somebody saying that the uh, public sector isn't um, innovative, just quote to them the internet, which is one of the greatest innovations to come out of the public sector. Um, so what I'm going to do in this session is... Uh, just going to do that, is I'm going to use international evidence. I'll use quite a lot of my own research, but also others too, uh, to actually uh, put forward some key provocations about innovation. So I really want to provoke you. I want you to go into the next session agreeing with me or disagreeing with me or having an argument with your neighbour but what, for whatever reason, really thinking about um, uh, innovation perhaps in a different way. And I want to be quite critical about innovation too, just thinking, is it at this current time of um, austerity and frugality, is it just a, a buzzword, you know, that we, uh, like a deodorant, that we just spray on tired institutions to try and freshen them up a bit? Because after all, innovation is always this shiny, sparkly, rather sexy word that is meant to improve uh, organisations. Uh, so let's um, uh, look at that somewhat sceptically. I don't mean cynically, I just mean sceptically. And can we use frugal innovation to improve governance and public services? So my eight and a half propositions are going to be about um, this matter. First of all, though, I want to, uh, if you like, set the scene by very briefly talking about what I mean by innovation because, and, and what a number of scholars would say is innovation. Because I think it's one of those words that's rather a portmanteau word that starts to get used for any kind of change, and that's inappropriate. So I think um, uh, a couple of things that are quite important. It's about new ideas and practices which are implemented so it's not just ideas, not just policy ideas, uh, not just great thoughts, but um, uh, new ideas and new practices which are actually implemented. Uh, John Besant is uh, particularly strong on that. And innovation isn't just the same as change. Uh, it's a particular form of change, and many people would argue that it is disruptive 
or step change uh, change. Um, so it's different from continuous improvement. It's not about gradually increasing efficiency and making things better. It's actually about doing things differently. And that may involve a different mindset, a different set of practices, something that's actually quite disruptive um, for the organization. And in relation to uh, the public sector, uh, Jeff Mulgan has talked about um, defining uh, public sector innovation as new ideas that, that work at creating public value. Not that necessarily achieve public value, but that, that are trying to achieve it. Because I think the um, other element of innovation I just want to um, uh, underline is I think a good definition of innovation doesn't uh, conflate it with improvement or better performance or success. It's quite possible to have very interesting uh, innovations that for whatever reason don't work. Uh, we can think of um, high-rise housing uh, in Britain in the 1960s as an example of that. Okay, that's a quick definition of that. Uh, and um, to remember also that innovation, many scholars would say it's about being new to the organization. So it doesn't have to be totally unique. It's about new and disruptive ideas and practices for the organization that starts to um, develop or adopt uh, this innovation. So just drawing on the Tempest, uh, when uh, these shipwrecked sailors uh, end up on the uh, island, and Miranda, who's never seen human beings in her life before, says, oh, brave new world that has such people in it. For her, people are an innovation. Her much more world-weary father, Prospero, says, tis new to thee. So that's a way, if you like, of underlining that um, uh, innovation is about newness to the organization. So it doesn't matter if it's already happened somewhere else. So I'm going to draw on those kind of definitions of innovation in my talk here today. Now, uh, I think the field of public services innovation or, or innovation in governance and public services has tended to draw quite a lot from the private sector. And that has been very valuable and has given us some really good ideas and is also very important in terms of um, public-private uh, partnerships and so on, hybrid organizations. But I think the difficulty with some of the private sector literature is it still uh, tends to focus on products. We tend to think of light bulbs or cars or LED lighting. Um, has, until recently, uh, put uh, less, uh, there's been less literature around um, service innovation. And service innovation is very different because you're not dealing with a product. Most service innovations are actually about a changed relationship between people, either between different staff groups or staff and, and uh, uh, citizens or whatever. So I want us to um, just be aware of that. But on the positive side, I think we are now starting to see a really good and burgeoning literature about uh, public innovation and seeing some of its distinctive features, um, and I'll, I'll refer to those. Now, finally, on my uh, introductory remarks, I'm going to draw on in my talk the idea of three phases of innovation, and I'm going to think of them in terms of invention, that is, where do the ideas from come from, creativity, uh, inventing uh, new ways of doing things, then there's the implementation stage, um, which might include piloting, trialing, uh, experiments, um, uh, really embedding uh, the innovation, and so on. And then thirdly, thinking about diffusion. Uh, in other words, the spreading of um, innovation uh, across different organizations. Now, that's a very simplified view of innovation. Lots of, there are lots of different models and stages and so on. And it doesn't always happen like this in any case because in the public sector, sometimes you get an implementation, uh, for example, an announcement by a, a politician, and then the public managers have to think about the innovation. So it does sometimes go the other way. Uh, and Christian Basin calls it a, a half-rolled-up ball of wool. But nevertheless, I think if we can think of these three terms, that will help us as we deal with the propositions. 
Right. Uh, proposition one. I hope you find this very contentious, but market stim uh, competition or market-like competition doesn't necessarily stimulate innovation. It can, but it doesn't always. What, uh, why uh, is that? Uh, I think we're used to the economic arguments that come particularly from Schumpeter, but also um, other economists, the idea of creative destruction, the idea that firms have to innovate or they die. Um, and I think sometimes we've imported that into public services. And, uh, well, we've had in the first two talks, haven't we, some discussion about does uh, market competition help bring about change and efficiency or does it not? Does it help innovation or not? So um, drawing on some work that I've, I've just done with um, Ava Sorensen and, and Jakob Torfing, um, we've shown uh, by looking at the literature that some people, and I'm just drawing on one person here, argues that markets produce both too much and too little innovation. And I'm talking here about the private sector. So too much in the sense of um, competition often encourages firms to uh, innovate at the invention stage and put a lot of effort into, into getting patents and design rights and so on. But a lot of firms find it hard to actually do the implementation stage. And part of David Teese's argument is that it's competition that makes that difficult. And sometimes too little innovation as well, uh, because where um, uh, firms feel that other, or, or believe that other firms are going to um, get the benefits of the innovation, in other words, they can't corral them um, to their own firm, that will also reduce innovation. So, uh, and uh, what we also know is that market competition reduces the diffusion phase of um, innovation. That's around spreading good practice or spreading promising practice. And that's a key element of innovation for public services. Uh, we're actually seeing it in the UK at the moment in relation to the NHS, where there's been a strong pressure on uh, greater competition between hospitals. But it's actually reducing the amount of sharing that happens uh, between uh, hospital consultants, um, allied health professionals, uh, managers, and so on. So that's my first uh, provocation to you. Uh, let, we need to think about when does market competition really stimulate innovation and when does it make it more difficult? And uh, thinking of those three phases, invention, implementation, diffusion, um, which are important to uh, the public sector. Right, uh, provocation number two or proposition number two is bureaucracy is both a help and a hindrance for innovation in both the public and the private sectors. Um, by bureaucracy, I mean a particular form of org organizing that's based around um, uh, job descriptions, tasks, offices, uh, uh, division of uh, labor, and so on. Uh, I mean it in, the, in that technical term rather than a, as a term of abuse. And there's some research which shows that bureaucracy makes it more difficult for organizations to be creative and to invent ideas about uh, innovation. Um, uh, there's a whole set of reasons uh, for that. I quite like James Wilson just reminding us why organizations exist. Organizations exist to reduce uncertainty and to introduce stability and routine. So it's not really surprising that uh, the more organizations are ordered and routinized and standardized, then the harder it is to actually uh, be involved in the invention stage of, of um, innovation. Now, it's interesting um, how Rainey's work shows that actually the private sector can be just as bureaucratic as the public sector. So we shouldn't think that we're particularly afflicted uh, in, that, in that sense. And I think one of the key issues we have to grapple with is um, what Julian Birkinshaw calls um, uh, uh, ambidextrous organizations. So in other words, how do you run business as usual, serving clients, serving citizens, and so on, and get involved in innovation at the same time? 
and different uh, organizations do it in different ways. Some try and uh, set up a separate department which is particularly uh, concerned with innovation and creation, horizon scanning, and so on. There are different ways to do it. Um, uh, and um, just a reminder that bureaucracy exists in, in all sectors. Uh, this is uh, General Motors in Detroit. You might have thought it was a government building, but it, actually it isn't. It's uh, General Motors in Detroit. And um, this is often what happens culturally in large organizations. Uh, so we shouldn't be surprised that it's quite difficult um, to be creative within large uh, bureaucratic organizations. And we may need to think particularly how to, how to, how to get around that. Um, but interestingly, the research shows that bureaucracies are also a help. And this is perhaps surprising, but they find it easier to implement uh, innovation. So once you've got the uh, pilot going, uh, or past the pilot stage, if you want to sustain uh, an innovation, you know, go for bureaucracy, get people writing the new procedures, the new, new standards, uh, and so on. So when you're ready to embed it, then large, uh, sorry, bureaucratic organizations um, are better at that. And also we know that larger organizations are better at implementation of innovation. And we know that large organizations tend to be bureaucratic. I'm slightly eliding two concepts here, large and bureaucracy. Um, and in fact, in the study uh, that I did over 10 years of all local authorities in England, all 388 of them, what we found was that the larger local authorities were the ones who were uh, much more likely to innovate and much more likely to uh, visit and share with other local authorities and with other kinds of organizations uh, in order to um, uh, get ideas for um, innovation. And they're uh, good at diffusing. So we shouldn't just knock bureaucracy. It has its place in innovation, somewhat surprisingly. Oh, yeah, and here's an example of um, uh, traditional bureaucracy um, often needed to achieve large-scale innovation. I, I've been doing some work in South Sudan, which is the newest country in the world. It got independence two years ago. I've been working with the government there, and I'm now a trustee of a, uh, a small charity building a girls' school uh, there. And actually, what you need is uh, good bureaucracy to build roads, to build hospitals, um, to build schools, and so on, which in that country uh, is an important innovation. So just a reminder of that. Now, proposition three, the key resource in organizations isn't primarily finance, but it's organizational energy. And I think in a period of austerity, and I certainly noticed this in the UK, often the talk is about the size of your budget, how much budget cut you've got, trying to do more with less, uh, and so on. We've got really severe budget cuts in um, the UK, as you may know, 20% over four years, with more in prospect. Um, but um, so often the focus is on money, but the real resource in organizations is people and the energy that they have, both as individuals, as groups, as teams, as departments, as the whole organization. So creating a positive climate for innovation can really help uh, in the creation and development uh, of new ideas and, and new practices. And we know there's a whole literature about high-performance organizations. Um, uh, there's some questions about what we mean by high-performance organizations, but ones which, um, in very broad terms, seem to be able to achieve their, their goals uh, efficiently and effectively. And on the whole, in both the private and the public sector, they tend to spend uh, quite a bit of time and attention thinking about how they engage and motivate um, uh, their staff. And just to link back to what Steve Kelman was saying, he was talking about unleashing change. I can see that very much, if you want, in terms of unleash, unleashing the energy for change. And I think they, the two pieces go uh, quite well together in that respect. Um, and we might think about uh, neuroscience as well. What if we thought about organizations using the metaphor of neuroscience? 
If we thought about electrical energy and chemical energy happening between synapses, and the idea that uh, in our, in our uh, uh, neural system, um, uh, energy is constantly flowing and uh, moving about and constantly creating new pathways, new neural networks. It's one of the key, um, or a key finding from neuroscience is around how dynamic our brains and our peripheral uh, nervous systems are. What if we thought about our organizations in terms of where does the energy happen in your organization and what are the conduits for it? And who are the people who act like synapses, helping to you know, translate energy from one side of a synapse uh, to another? It's a very, very different picture of innovation than you would get uh, from an organization chart, which is very standard, very static, uh, and so on. Now, I'm only using this as a metaphor, but I hope it's a useful one for thinking about um, unlocking uh, energy for change. And I think, actually, that links, again, very well with what Steve Kelman was talking about, about the, um, uh, he called them the change vanguard, um, it's this idea that there are already people in the organization who've got energy and sense of purpose and direction and so on. And um, just co continuing this notion of um, energy, uh, I only put this picture up because it was nice and vibrant. Uh, uh, it's quite difficult to find pictorial representations of uh, energy in a way. But I took this uh, uh, comment from Larry Lynn about innovation. And he said it requires in a leader uh, a bit of charisma combined with a lot of judgment uh, and so on. I won't read it all out. But look at how many of those words actually are about energy, charisma, argument, passion, action. These are all about um, energy. So innovation is often about how do you get energy flowing in a system and how do you get lateral uh, thoughts uh, and practices uh, developing. A couple of pieces of research around organizational energy. Uh, well, the first one is, is kind of bears on it. It's not actually directly about it. But I did some work um, a couple of years ago uh, with some colleagues, Tina Kiefer and others, in which we asked uh, nearly, well, a thousand public sector employees about their views about work, about cuts, about organizational change, just before the big announcement of cuts in the UK, and then for 18 months afterwards. And we gave people a list of different kind of, uh, of changes that were taking place. And what we found was that their positive attitudes were much more around what we as researchers classified as innovation, new ways of doing things, um, new practices, and so on, than about um, salami slicing uh, cutbacks. So it's our definition of the uh, characterization. And in all the circumstances, they were experiencing the same level of cutback. So same degree of uh, job losses, voluntary redundancy, and so on. But again, it goes back to actually Steve. I can't, where is Steve? Just behind, okay. Um, uh, Steve was talking about the importance of narrative. Uh, and in a way, one can see this here, where people felt that something was about innovation and was going to be something new that they could uh, put their energies into, uh, then it was seen as more positive. And there's a very interesting piece of work from the NHS, from the Institute for Innovation and Improvement. Uh, uh, actually, no, sorry, now it's called the... Um, uh, what's it called, NHSIQ, Improvement and Quality. Um, it's one of our reorganizations. Anyway, um, really interesting paper that I would uh, commend to you to have a look at, where they talk about five types of energy happening in organizations. Uh, social energy, so what's the energy that happens in teams, esprit de corps, sense of morale uh, in organizations what they call spiritual energy. They don't mean religious or faith-based, but they mean a sense of a higher purpose, a sense of direction that, uh, that people have uh, about the organization. Thirdly, psychological energy, uh, which is around uh, having courage, having trust in other people, having a sense of um, psychological safety as you take risk. 
uh, physical energy, uh, actually energy to get things done, to do things, and intellectual energy, curiosity, uh, horizon scanning, strategic analysis, planning. And I think it's... Um, now, some of us who are psychologists would say, well, those five types of energy uh, are characterized by other concepts that psychologists have been working with for uh, a number of years. But I think it's quite a neat characterization of in, in thinking from an energy point of view. And it's worth thinking, perhaps, for your organizations, which of these energies are particularly present and which ones are much more absent? What they found in the NHS, for example, was that um, there was a lot of intellectual energy, a lot of very bright people, a lot of strategic planning, a lot of documents being produced, a lot of physical energy, people doing things, operations and uh, care for, for people, but quite low on um, social, spiritual and um, psychological energy. So um, we know that uh, energy is really important. I think we've under-theorized it, we've under-talked about it, um, but it's particularly important for innovation. Right, proposition number four. Harvesting ideas and practices from other actors can save time and money. This is really good for frugal innovation. You don't need to invent and create things right from scratch. A lot of really good ideas uh, that you can use in your organizations are probably out there somewhere in any case. And it may be a question of drawing on what's sometimes called recombinant innovation. You take something from somewhere else and you use it uh, in a different way. So I want to just draw on the Formula One pit stop. At Great Ormond Street Hospital, one Saturday afternoon, there were a couple of theater consultants, uh, doctors, uh, who were there with a, a, a can of beer in their hands watching Formula One, and they suddenly thought that watching a pit stop, that this could be a really useful um, uh, concept to think about the transfer of patients from theatre into high-intensive care, where that particular handover is a real problem for patient safety. Um, so they looked at it and worked out obviously adapted it, um, but, thought about, <laughs> uh, but thought about what were the particular roles? What about training, getting people trained, rehearsed over and over again, the importance of the lollipop man, who's the, the final arbiter about whether the uh, uh, car can go back onto the track or not. They used those ideas, uh, and it was not costly at all. Um, uh, recombinant innovation. And we should also think about open innovation much more. This is a really uh, very big topic in, um, uh, in, the, in the private sector, thinking about drawing on users, members of the public, citizens, and so on. Often they're really interested in the services that we, uh, that we provide. Often many of them are experts at it, uh, and they can actually see ideas and uh, draw them in. So drawing on some of the work of Chesborough and uh, von Hippel and so on. So um, there's a, a, a children helping to design hospital environments. There's a, a website called Patients Like Me. I don't know if you've come across that, in which patients talk about uh, their experience of um, medicines. And now doctors and pharmacists are drawing on that for... Um, uh, evidence about side effects and so on. Not the same as a randomized control trial, but still useful. What if we had a, a website which was called Citizens Like Us? I did look it up to see if there was one, and there isn't, so that's something you could uh, think about. So, open innovation, I think uh, some examples of that, Lego, Nokia, uh, a children's hospital. And in order to use either recombinant innovation or open innovation or collaborative innovation, Jenny Lewis will talk more about that, I think, uh, it involves actually thinking in whole systems terms and really trying to see the whole picture and where you can get ideas from. Right, proposition five. Remember, I've got eight and a half, so we're, we're, um, hopefully you're feeling provoked already by some of this. 
diffusion of innovation is the public sector's secret weapon. I think there's far too much interest in innovation studies in the invention and in the implementation stage. They're both important, but we haven't given enough thought to, uh, or enough studies uh, to um, uh, diff uh, diffusion because it can be a really effective way of reducing costs. It reduces risks. Now, somebody talked about the problem of innovation and risk, but if you're taking an idea from somewhere else, it actually reduces both the political risk, the financial risk, and maybe the operational risk as well. If you can say in London, you know, Manchester's already doing this, or Brisbane's already doing this, uh, then it, it can help uh, enormously. And building links across um, uh, different organizations to share, uh, to share best practice. And it may be worth thinking about in your organization, how much energy or how much financial resources actually goes into diffusion. Presumably some, because you're all here at the ANZOG conference, which in a way is uh, an opportunity to share um, ideas and so on. Uh, so why don't we do more uh, uh, sharing across boundaries? It seems to be the area that the public sector finds um, quite difficult. There's some evidence uh, on that. Sometimes we see our own organizations as rather special or different or different political uh, uh, control or, or whatever. So I think we need to stop calling it stealing, stealing ideas from other organizations, and we should openly uh, share. Uh, so this is the diffusion bit. Um, now I want to just uh, talk uh, in illustration of this, some ideas uh, about diffusion from the very large study I did uh, in the UK about the Beacon Scheme, which was about high performers and innovators and um, uh, weak, so-called weak and mediocre organizations learning from them. When we asked them whether they'd visited a beacon, when we asked organizations if they'd visited a beacon and taken ideas back into their own organization and used it for organizational change and or innovation, uh, then we found that of those that did, which was about three quarters, 63% said that they adapted the idea that they had seen uh, from the innovator. And this shows that ad adaptation or adaption is uh, often uh, m happens more than uh, adoption. So two thirds are saying that they adapt an idea. 29% said they accelerated an idea that they already had. So they said, we already had this um, uh, idea for an innovation, but visiting the beacon helped us speed it up. Now, that may be partly a, a kind of attributional uh, thing, um, uh, you know, we, we had the idea anyway kind of thing. But it seems that ac that acceleration is helping to reduce risk, uh, to increase confidence, and to build political support because it's possible to say we're not going to be out on a limb on this because somewhere else is already doing it. So it reduced risk, helped with confidence, and so on. Only 8% said they based their improvement closely on the innovator. So I think that's really interesting to think about diffusion in that way. And replication rarely occurs. Um, it's much more likely to be adaptation. Now, Proposition 6, uh, just keeping an eye on the time here. Uh, I'm going to whiz along a bit, I think. Um, knowledge creation and learning is central to innovation. You can't just uh, develop ideas, implement them, or whatever, without people having to learn new ways of doing things uh, and to make mistakes uh, and to learn how to um, give up particular ways of working uh, and uh, adopt other ones. Um, so it's often uh, essential, but it's often uh, unremarked. And uh, what we found in the research in local government was that actually local government had to learn how to learn about um, innovation. And over time, they shifted from learning to uh, imitate to learning to innovate. And in order to do that, they started to do things like give staff more time to talk about um, 
what was currently happening, how to handle the innovation. They might set up more uh, seminars. Um, there, there might be more discussion between politicians and managers about what would work uh, and what wouldn't. So I think we need to give people time and space to be able to make mistakes uh, and to learn the new ways of doing things. Because innovation is rarely um, you know, a, a primrose path. It's full of all sorts of obstacles and cul-de-sacs and frustrations and so on. And people need time to learn from that. And interestingly, in the scheme, we found that where learning took place between uh, local authorities, um, the learners wanted to learn as much about the frustration and the barriers and the problems as they did about the successes. Right, I'm going to uh, shift on a bit. Um, right, public innovation can benefit from the contributions of elected politicians. That might sound a rather obvious statement, but many, no, some perhaps I should say, managers feel that they could innovate without politicians. They'd manage better without politicians. And it's really surprising that the academic literature on uh, innovation hardly mentions politicians at all. It's really surprising. But they're really important in all sorts of ways, partly using new language to help mobilise support. Uh, one can think of Ken Livingstone uh, bringing in congestion charging uh, in London, concept that was unknown before then, but he really helped to get people to understand it. They're really important for embedding um, innovation, building support, creating a climate uh, for trying new ideas, and so on. And they are often really important in actually having ideas for innovation. One can think about um, uh, Britain in the post-Second World War reconstruction. We can think of my own university, the Open University, which wouldn't have happened without politicians. Uh, uh, so lots of examples of that. Uh, proposition eight, we shouldn't have a single phrase which is innovation and improvement, as though it's a single policy phrase, as though innovation always leads to improvement. So not all innovations lead to improvement. Um, there's some estimates that in the private sector, you know, around a third to, well, much, much higher uh, innovations fail or they're inappropriate for the particular time. Um, and in the public sector, that is likely to be higher, not because um, public servants are less good at innovation, but there's a more critical environment within which um, innovations occur. But also, not all improvement needs innovation. There are uh, situations in which efficiency drives doing things uh, better rather than doing things different uh, is important, and we have methodologies for, for that. So the question is about fitness for purpose. And I guess the key uh, question about the effectiveness of innovation is, does it create or does it try to create uh, public value outcomes? I know you're all familiar with that particular framework. Public value, I'm just giving a definition there. And Christian Basin talking about public value around four key important themes, productivity, service experience, results, both outputs and outcomes, and democracy. And I think we shouldn't forget the uh, innovations in democracy or the Im implications for democracy. Right, I'm nearly there, John. So um, now, buy eight, get one free. That's a typical um, uh, frugal kind of um, situation, isn't it? Which is about building an evidence base. I said right at the beginning that... Um, we, we were still too reliant on ideas from the private sector and in particular manufacturing. So I think it's really important that we try and build up a good evidence base about what works um, for innovation. When do market conditions really help innovation? When does uh, bureaucracy really support innovation? When do networking and open innovation uh, help? Because there's unlikely to be uh, I think I can definitely say there won't be one best way in relation to innovation. It's partly on the context, the political uh, climate, um, the purpose of the innovation, and so on. So we really need to build up an evidence base and to rigorously monitor and evaluate um, uh, innovation. 
uh, not quietly sideline it when it doesn't work. We've got too much, too much in the way of archaeological layers of failed innovation in the public sector where something was trumpeted as a fantastic innovation, doesn't quite work, just sort of quietly gets parked and not get referred to again. So we need to learn from failures as well as from successes. That's where I think ANZOG is particularly important because it brings together academics and practitioners with a real rich uh, experience uh, and lots of context in which we can uh, explore um, innovation and really try and uh, work out uh, what works for the public sector with its, um, in the importance of trying to develop public value, uh, to harvest ideas rather than just invent them uh, within the organisation, and to spread um, innovation uh, across a whole sector, the hospital sector, the local government sector, or whatever. I hope I provoked you. Um, I hope that might come across in questions, which I guess uh, John will now be seeking from you. Thank you. I was really interested in the frame that you presented for organisational energy. Sometimes we can think of that as some sort of organisational equivalent to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do you think, though, that there's a need to progress through those various levels of energy? Which would you address first in order to stimulate the others? Um, I think I would want to say that I, I don't think it's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, where is it? I can't remember where it is. There. Oh, have I gone past it? There we are. Yeah. Okay. Um, what the work from the NHS is saying, and I think other psychological work uh, as well, is that actually most organisations need some elements of all these different kinds of um, energy. Uh, if you spend too much on certain types of energy, you, you develop particular strengths, but you may have weaknesses um, in other areas. One can think of police forces, which are really good on physical energy, but perhaps sometimes don't spend enough time on intellectual energy, for example. Uh, really good on, on social energy, uh, often. And also, when you're innovating, do you need particular if you like, pushes on particular types of energy. Maybe certain types of energy really need some good intellectual energy. But then when you're embedding the um, innovation, maybe you need more social energy around teams and um, uh, departments and so on. So we've hardly started working with concepts of energy and uh, it'll need quite a lot of research to really uh, look at that. I, my, I think my first inclination would be it's gonna depend on the context. Um, uh, yeah, it's going to depend on the context and what kind of skills and what kind of inherent energy you already have in the organisation. Certain kinds of innovation are also particularly testing, if you like, around um, uh, uh, energy. Often bringing in a change or an innovation is very testing on physical energy. People get exhausted. So um, just need to think about that. So very context-based, I would say, is my guess. Um, just picking up on the last point, um, with these tremendous cuts uh, cascading through many public sector organizations, many of your arguments um, rely on what the old-fashioned uh, analysts would call um, organizational slack in systems. So what yep. are the kinds of arguments that you would make for organizations to invest in um, you know, non uh, goal-oriented activity to learn. Uh, there are a number of things there. When travel budgets are being cut, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, yeah, it is, it is quite difficult when there's less organisational slack, uh, less opportunity for uh, training and development, for example, for visiting other organisations and so on. But we do have new technologies that could help uh, you know, using webinars, um, uh, using Skype, uh, a whole range of, of ways. So once you've made your initial contact with an organisation, um, I think also what we've discovered from the work on, on local government as well was that um, those organisations that were particularly good at learning from innovators actually prepared quite carefully before they met the innovator. 
So they knew, they tried to work out what it was they wanted to learn. So they were quite focused in, in what they were trying to learn. It wasn't just kind of turning up and having a look and so on. Uh, it was for those that were less experienced, but the more experienced they became, they became more focused. I'm not sure that quite answers your question. I think one, one of the things I've been trying to say about these propositions um, is, well, particularly the one about harvesting ideas, if we just go back to that a moment, um, wherever it was. You know, thinking about where you get ideas from other people, it doesn't all have to be invented within the organisation. You know, it used to be that um, car companies, um, uh, detergent companies and so on, had big R&D departments that invented products, ideas and so on. Quite big expenditure on that. Quite often they're, they're reducing that very substantially and actually just going out and looking for where the ideas already are. And that concept of harvesting, I think, is a, a really frugal idea. 